to hear from someone who is a picture of Jesus Christ. You see, the name Hebron means fellowship. Uh, we can most readily understand that what Joseph enjoyed was fellowship with his father. Notice also the careful words used in Scripture when it says, he sent him out of the veil to Hebron. You see, it, it is as if he crested the protection of Hebron and was found in a dangerous place. His father was willing to offer his well-beloved son. The son, Joseph, was willing to follow his command. Dad said, I need you, I need you to go. And he said, I'm ready to go. You know I'll go. Here am I. You know, you can almost hear old Jacob whisper to himself, surely they'll receive my son, surely they see his heart. Surely they can appreciate his spirit is right. They're going to receive him. Sounds a lot like the way uh, you would have expected people to receive Jesus Christ. Yet that's not the case, is it? In Mark chapter 12, Jesus told the parable of a man who had entrusted his vineyard to some stewards, but they had taken possession of it as if they were owners. They had killed the servants uh, that they sent. So finally, he sent his own son. Notice Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Notice verse 6 with me. Mark chapter 12, verse 6. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son... But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. I'll tell you, when you study the Bible, compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll find out often that much of what you read in the New Testament can be drawn from Old Testament truth. Joseph was the son that was willing to go. I'll throw this one out for free. Are you willing to go when God calls you? Shechem was the place to which he would be going. He was, he was a, uh, it, it was a place of bad memories for Jacob and his family. It was a place where uh, Dinah, Jacob's daughter, had lost her moral innocence, and where Simeon and Levi lost their moral integrity. It was where they had slaughtered the men of Shechem. To such a dangerous place, Joseph quickly said, here am I. He didn't pause, he didn't stop, he didn't stutter, he didn't delay. He said, here am I. When the Lord says to you, I need you to go, what should be the response? Here am I. Well, wait a second. Let me stop and think about it. Let me kick it around a little bit. You know, life isn't so easy where you're asking me to go. Lord, you're calling me to Mexico where people are dying? Here am I. Here am I. You want to know what it's like to look in the face of a missionary like Larry Lilly, who without even hesitation or any regard for his own life said, the Lord has called us to Mexico and we'll only leave when the Lord tells us to go. Amen? Amen. You know, this is right after he hears of missionaries who were killed on the mission field in their own home. You see... Their response to any call from the Lord would be, here am I. Here am I. You see, Joseph appears to have uh, held on uh, tightly to uh, doing what his father told him to do. May I say this? We're to hold on to the will of our heavenly father. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. John chapter uh, 6 verse 38. For I come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. All through the scripture we see this is the case. Psalm 40 verse 8 says, 
I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I just believe we saw an example of this uh, on this Sunday afternoon when in the flesh Tom did not have uh, a, a burning joy to go and talk to somebody who was... Uh, uh, a little bit of an aggravation in the in the park where they live, uh, parking his car in such a way that it made it difficult for others. But you want to know what he did? He shared the good news of Jesus Christ with this gentleman. And by the way, even people who drive around in a Lexus can get saved. Amen. 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 And you know, what, can I, can I tell you, you're in a church where that happens more often than not. You're in a place where people do that because they know that's what they need to do. Not, a, not because we're always having a warm and fuzzy feeling and we're thinking, oh, that's the neatest, nicest person in the world. I just want to visit with them and talk with them and witness to them. Sometimes it's going to be someone you don't want to talk to. It's going to be someone you're not that interested in, in going to. But the Lord will say, go. And you'll say, here am I. Here am I. I just want to delight my father. I want to do what would delight him. You see, with great abandon, Joseph was not only resolved to do the will of his father, but it was, it was his great joy to do so. You see, Joseph wanted to please his father. Joseph found pleasure in pleasing his father, not in doing what, not in necessarily the task that was at hand. He had no joy in that. He knew. He had kind of got a sense that, uh, you know what? They don't like me. But he went, and he did because he wanted to please his father. The Bible says, so he sent him out of the veil of Hebron and came to Shechem. He went, he went, he made up his mind, and he did not delay right away. He did what he was supposed to do. And you'll notice no return, no return. Joseph came to Shechem. The name Shechem actually means shoulder. Uh, it brings to us the understanding that Shechem is a, a place of bearing burdens. You know... Many in this room can talk about heavy weights on their shoulders. Joseph left the Vale of Hebron and all of its fellowship to willingly come to a place, this place of Shechem, and begin to be the bearer of a burden, not his own. This is a perfect picture of what Christ did for us. Christ came. He came for you and I. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. You know, we talked about in Sunday school the fact that those young Hebrews, those young Jewish converts or Finnish complete Christians were having a tough time uh, with their salvation. Can I tell you how people got saved early on in the first century uh, before we had the completed New Testament by the Old Testament? That's exactly how you would uh, lead uh, someone who is steeped in Judaism to the Lord. You would turn to, for example, Isaiah 53, and you would read verses like verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. May I tell you, I've had Jewish rabbis tell me that they actually pass over this scripture. They don't, they don't try to explain it away. They don't even read it. And you will see shock and awe when you actually read this to someone. And I can tell you over and over again that, that, that 
If you want people to know the same Savior that you know, you need to be able to show them from the Word of God who he is. And I got to tell you, these verses are very powerful. Jesus continues to be the burden bearer for all who come to him. I, I'm, I'm one who knows that I'm thankful for a Savior who bears my burdens. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So let's kind of refocus and, 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 and evaluate this story in light of Scripture and see a loving father who sends an obedient son to a disobedient family. Wow, that sounds a whole lot like the world in which we live in. We see his own received him not. His own received him not. And may I say this? God is still in control. God is still in control. He was obedient. He did what his father asked him to do. He found joy in doing so. And he knows that God is in control. Notice again Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37, notice verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Come, uh, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will come, what will become of his dreams. Now, when you read that in a two-dimensional way, you may not get all that's being said here, but they are smirking, they're snotty, they're mean, they're, they have a spirit that is so wicked. You see, the picture, the picture of Jesus. And Joseph are obvious. You know, this allows us to look partially for a few moments at what lie before Joseph. You know, uh, I know when you get used to a story, and many of you may be really kind of tapping into the story of Joseph for the first time, you, you forget that you got to look at the timeline. You got to think about what it must have been like for Joseph to step into this and to, and to, and to begin to have to deal with this. You see, Joseph had grossly underestimated his own children and what was in their hearts. Can I tell you, that's not a surprise. Things haven't changed that much. He failed to understand the, 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 the depravity of their wicked ways and the depth of hatred that they had toward Joseph. He failed to truly know his own children. May I say... Sadly, things haven't changed. We almost, uh, uh, to, uh, I would say, to a person, you could ask anybody in this room if they've ever talked with someone about a, a wayward child and the parent never could quite get, wrap their brain around the fact that their child was so gone, so lost, so far away. That's what we see happening. And all through the Bible, by the way, you'll find good men, godly men, uh, making mistakes with rotten children. Not understanding, not appreciating how bad things are. You see, not just our children, but the human heart which these children obviously possessed. The, 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 their hearts were black. You see, passive parenting appears to be the model left for us by Jacob. It didn't work for him, nor will it work for us. Look at Jacob's example. First of all, he didn't act when he learned of Reuben's infidelity with his own wife. Might you think when things are starting to happen, you ought to kind of wake up just a little bit? He didn't respond when Simeon and Levi lied and took the lives of the men of Shechem. We see no course of action taken when Joseph brought back 
to his father the evil report.